Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is pneumatic systems. Our objective is to introduce pneumatic systems. We'll discuss their characteristics as well as examine the similarities and important differences between pneumatic and hydraulic systems. Warning, the pneumatics playlist is not intended to be a standalone playlist, but rather a bonus round extension of the hydraulics playlist available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't completed this aforementioned lecture series yet, only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. The pneumatics playlist presumes the viewer can perform circular area and cylindrical volume calculations, can use Pascal's law, is able to interpret fluid power schematics with ease, understands pressure and flow control, and has an intimate understanding of how fundamental fluid power properties like valve position, pressure, and flow rate dictate system performance. I categorically refuse to rehash these same subjects since they equally apply to pneumatic systems. This being said, it's perhaps worth a quick review to ensure your existing tool set is in working order. First, a directional control valve is used to stop, start, and change direction of fluid flow in a fluid power system. When this valve is placed in the cross-connect position, pressurized flow is routed to the rod end and the cap end is exhausted at low pressure. The double acting cylinder retracts. Conversely, when placed in the straight through position, pressurized fluid is routed to the cap end and the rod end is exhausted at low pressure. The double acting cylinder extends. In summary, valve position determines actuator direction. This is true for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Next, Pascal's law states that force is equal to pressure times area. Increased pressure on a large surface area results in more force. Conversely, decreased pressure on a smaller surface area results in less force. As a quick test of your requisite knowledge, consider a double acting cylinder with a cap diameter of three and a half inches and a rod diameter of an inch and a half. Let's say the maximum pressure this system is capable of exerting is six bar. See if you can determine the maximum extension force and the maximum retraction force of this cylinder. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Extension necessitates pressurized fluid enter the cap end port and the rod end port be exhausted at low pressure. During extension, pressurized fluid acts on the full cap end area. The circular cap end is equal to pi over 4 times the diameter of the cap squared. Substituting our values results in a cap area of roughly 9.6 square inches. Retraction necessitates pressurized fluid enter the rod end port and the cap end port be exhausted at low pressure. During retraction, pressurized fluid acts on the ring-like annular surface area of the rod end. The area of the rod is equal to pi over 4 times the diameter of the rod squared. Substituting in our given values results in a rod area of roughly 1.8 square inches. The ring-like rod end area is equal to the area of the cap minus the area of the rod. Substituting in our calculated values results in a rod end area of roughly 7.9 square inches. One bar is equal to roughly 14.5 psi. A unit conversion demonstrates our maximum pressure of 6 bar is equal to roughly 87 psi. Extension uses the full circular cap end area. An application of Pascal's law demonstrates that 87 psi acting on the surface area of 9.6 square inches results in a maximum extension force of roughly 837 pounds. Retraction uses the smaller ring-like rod end area. An application of Pascal's law demonstrates 87 psi acting on a surface area of 7.9 square inches results in a maximum retraction force of roughly 683.3 pounds force. You will note that given the same pressure, extension force is greater than retraction. Why? Because during extension, pressure acts on the full circular cap end area, whereas during retraction, pressure acts on the smaller ring-like rod end area. This is always true. In summary, pressure determines the force of a fluid power system. This is true for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. By the way, if you didn't get these answers, go away. You are not presently up to the task. Like I mentioned earlier, the pneumatics playlist necessitates the user have the prerequisite knowledge of the preceding hydraulics playlist. Feel free to return to this lecture when you are so qualified. Lastly, actuator speed is dependent upon flow rate. Flow rate Q is a measure of volume per unit time. To calculate extension time, one would divide the full cylindrical volume of the cap end by the incoming flow rate. Similarly, to calculate retraction time, one would divide the smaller tubular volume of the rod end by the incoming flow rate. Any increase in flow rate or decrease in volume results in shorter extension and retraction times. Conversely, any decrease in flow rate or increase in volume 
results in longer extension or retraction times. In summary, flow rate determines the speed of a fluid power system. This is true for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Ultimately, valve position determines actuator direction, pressure determines actuator force, and flow rate determines actuator speed. If you emerge from the hydraulics playlist with just this simple understanding intact, I will consider my efforts having not been spent in vain. To suggest that these are independent and isolated phenomenon is an obvious oversimplification. As we learned in the aforementioned lecture series, there is an interplay between pressure and flow rate and vice versa, such that flow control methods like meter in, meter out, and bypass, and pressure control valves like sequence valves, pressure reducing valves, unloading valves, and counterbalance valves influence fluid system performance. So direction, force, and speed can be varied as the user sees fit. What's nice about pneumatics is all these same relationships hold true, albeit with some subtle and not so subtle performance differences. Allow me to demonstrate. As you are no doubt aware, a fluid is something that does not have a definite shape and conforms to the shape of its container. Both liquids and gases are fluids. A liquid is a fluid that has a definite volume, but no definite shape. For our intents and purposes, liquids are to be considered essentially incompressible, meaning that a certain quantity of liquid always has the same volume at any and all pressure conditions. By the way, this is another obvious oversimplification, but good enough for our use. Hydraulic systems use pressurized liquids, typically oil, to perform tasks easier or quicker than can an unaided human. Pneumatic systems, in contrast, use pressurized gases, typically environmental air conditioned for use. A gas is also a fluid, only it has neither a definite volume nor a definite shape and fills the shape and volume of its container. Gases are compressible, meaning that a given quantity of gas molecules could be compressed into a smaller volume or expanded to a larger volume. The simple difference between incompressible liquids and compressible gases has a dramatic consequence regarding the performance of similarly configured hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Consider a double acting hydraulic cylinder. When spring offset into the cross connect position, pressurized incompressible oil is routed to the rod end and the cap end is routed to tank at low pressure. The cylinder retracts. When manually positioned to the straight through position, Pressurized incompressible oil is routed to the cap end, and the rod end is routed to tank at low pressure. The cylinder extends. No surprises here. Similarly, consider an almost identically configured double acting pneumatic cylinder. When spring offset into the deactivated state, pressurized compressible air is routed to the rod end. Incoming pressurized air is schematically illustrated as an inward pointing clear triangle. The cap end, however, is not routed to tank but rather exhausted to the environment. An exhaust port is identified using an outward pointing clear triangle. The cylinder retracts. When the valve is manually moved into the activated position, pressurized compressible air is routed to the cap end, and this time the rod end is exhausted to the surrounding environment. The cylinder extends. Again, no surprises here. Long story short, valve position controls actuator direction for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. The fundamental difference being that in pneumatic systems, exhausted air is not routed back to a tank as it is in a hydraulic system, but rather expelled into the environment. After all, air is clean and free, at least for the time being, and you can always get some more. This is one of the major advantages of pneumatic systems. The fluid used in pneumatic systems, air, is cheap, clean, and plentiful, given we're quite literally immersed in it at all times. Oil, in contrast, is dirty, heavy, expensive, and must be contained in a reservoir for continual reuse. This exhausted air expelled into the environment in pneumatic systems often results in a characteristic hiss every time a valve is shifted from one position to the next. You note this particular valve has two exhaust ports, and these exhaust ports are located at the bottom of the valve body at the point of use. Sometimes you'll see a muffler or a silencer intended to minimize this hissing sound. The muffler schematic symbol is kind of this maze-like zigzag passage for escaping air. Mufflers or silencers are designed such that the exhausted air doesn't experience any undue back pressure. Visually, a muffler or a silencer looks like a little thimble or a filter screwed into a port or sometimes a perforated screen. We'll examine pneumatic directional control valves and other components unique to pneumatic systems in greater detail in later lectures. While I've got this example in front of us, let's discuss how pressure and flow rate influence actuator force and speed for these two different systems. Presuming our earlier figures remain valid, i.e. a cylinder with a cap diameter of 3.5 inches and a rod diameter of 1.5 inches and a system capable of producing at maximum a pressure of 87 psi, 
Pascal's law would demonstrate that both systems will extend with 837 pounds force and retract with 683.3 pounds force. Presuming a constant flow rate at these conditions, extension will be slower and retraction will be faster because extension necessitates a larger cap end volume be filled and retraction uses a smaller tubular rond end volume. Again, no surprises here. In summary, valve position controls actuator direction, pressure controls actuator force, and flow rate determines actuator speed. Like I said, these fundamental properties remain equally valid for both systems. This being said, important differences do exist, largely due to oil's incompressibility and air's compressibility. Consider a double acting hydraulic cylinder and a three position valve spring centered in a closed center position. The oil in the cap end and the rod end are incompressible. For all intents and purposes, you could swap out this oil and fill it with rock, steel, or solid concrete. Oil is incompressible and the cylinder will remain rigid, locked, and fully extended. This would be great if you wanted to lift something heavy and lock it perfectly in place. Not so much in a pneumatic system. Consider a pneumatic cylinder at full extension. The air in the cap end is compressible. If the extended rod encountered sufficient resistance, let's say you forced a heavy weight against it, there'd be a little give to it because of air's inherent spongy compressible nature. This would be great if you wanted to lift or push something but still absorb shocks. In summary, because of air's compressible nature, pneumatics might have a little spongy give to them. Depending upon application, this might or might not be a desirable feature. The compressibility of a fluid also influences how pressurized fluids flow through a system. The flow of incompressible oil in a hydraulic system is readily predictable because of continuity, meaning if one gallon per minute enters one end of a system, one gallon per minute must come out. A fitting analogy to describe this phenomenon might be a school bus absolutely packed with incompressible children with a door at both ends. When one incompressible kid hops on the full bus through the back door, one equally incompressible kid pops out the front. Whereas the compressible nature of gases in pneumatic systems leads to non-linearities and surges in flow. An example might be stuffing balloons onto an empty bus. At first, you can rapidly stuff more and more balloons, but soon space is filled and you gotta work harder and harder to stuff more balloons in until a certain point is reached and they just kinda burst out the other side all at once. Pneumatic actuators, rather than extending and retracting smoothly the moment flow begins, tend to rapidly pop into place once a certain actuation point is achieved. I don't intend to go into great detail about these non-linearities. However, certain fundamental similarities remain. Larger volumes take a long time to fill at low flow rates. In contrast, smaller volumes at high flow rates fill quickly. Non-linearities aside, flow rate still determines actuator speed. We'll examine the relationship of pressure, volume, and temperature for ideal gases in later lectures. Fluid compressibility influences other system characteristics. Consider a double acting hydraulic cylinder with a blocked rod end port. The oil in the blocked rod end is incompressible. Again, for all intents and purposes, you could swap out that oil in the rod end and fill it with rock steel or solid concrete. When the valve shifted the straight through position, nothing happens. Oil is incompressible and the cylinder will not extend. Not so in a pneumatic system. Consider a double acting pneumatic cylinder with a blocked rod end port. Schematically, blanking plugs are represented as X's or sometimes T's. If we shut off the incoming air and place a blanking plug on both the rod end port and the valve, turn the system back on and shift the valve to the extension position, we'll find the cylinder continues to extend, albeit with less force and speed as the air in the blocked rod end is compressed. Additionally, given all that compressed air in the blocked rod end, consider what happens when the cap is exhausted atmosphere by shifting back to the retract position. The compressed air trapped in the rod end is free to re-expand and the rod springs back. The point being that the compressible nature of air makes a pneumatic cylinder with a blocked rod end port behave fundamentally differently from a hydraulic cylinder using incompressible oil. Here's yet another example of the differences between liquid and gas-based fluid power systems. Consider a partially extended double acting hydraulic cylinder filled with incompressible oil. If I hook the rod end to the cap end, can an external force push the rod back in? The answer is no. The cap end contains more volume, the rod end less. The act of retraction necessitates that a larger cap end volume be stuffed into the smaller rod end volume, an impossible task for an incompressible liquid. 
for traction won't work, can an external force pull the rod out? The answer again in practice is no. The act of extension necessitates the smaller rod end volume be stuffed into the larger cap end volume. This isn't as easy as you might suspect because the missing volume in the cap end needs to be filled by something. I suppose you could pull hard enough to make the oil in the cap end transition to its vapor phase, i.e. induce a precavitation event, but that's a less than ideal special case scenario. In summary, when configured in this fashion, a double acting hydraulic cylinder filled with incompressible oil can neither be extended nor retracted. Not so with the pneumatic cylinder. Consider a partially extended double acting pneumatic cylinder with a rod end and cap end joined together at atmospheric pressure. Can an external force push the rod back in? No problem. The larger volume of the air in the cap end compresses into the smaller end with relative ease. Can an external force pull the rod out? Not an issue. The smaller volume of air in the rod end expands into the larger cap end with relative ease. If I was moving around more than atmospheric pressure, you might observe the rod bounce back in place after repositioning it. In this capacity, the double acting cylinder would act like a shock absorber on a car or a mountain bike. To further accentuate this point, consider a pneumatic cylinder where pressurized air is routed to both the cap and the rod end. When the valve is actuated, both cap and rod end are placed at the same pressure. And because the cap end has more functional area than does the smaller rod end, the cylinder extends in a regenerative fashion. In the fully extended position, an outside force acting against the rod compresses the air trapped in the cap end. When released, the rod springs back in shock absorber fashion. I must reiterate the compressible nature of air makes a pneumatic cylinder behave fundamentally different from a hydraulic cylinder using incompressible oil. We'll examine other features of compressible gases and components unique to pneumatic systems in later lectures. Moving on. Now that we've got at least an introduction of how compressibility affects the behavior of pneumatic actuators, let's quickly compare and contrast other features of hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Both types of fluid power systems are used to perform work quicker, more powerfully, or more efficiently than an unaided human. As we've previously discussed, the fundamental difference between these two types of systems is the type of fluid used to transfer power. Hydraulic systems make use of incompressible liquid, ordinarily oil, whereas pneumatic systems use a compressible gas, ordinarily air. Besides compressibility, other characteristics clearly distinguishes the two means of power transfer. Oil is heavy, dirty, expensive, and return flow needs to be routed to a reservoir. Spilled oil presents slip and contamination hazards and can create a fire hazard. Air, in contrast, is clean, inexpensive, and can be exhausted directly into the environment without risk of flammability, contamination, or slip hazards. This means a pneumatic system might be a more appropriate choice for food or medical applications where cleanliness is a concern. Hydraulics have a tendency to be used for medium and heavy duty applications, whereas pneumatic systems are customarily employed in light to medium duty applications, where the division between light, medium, and heavy is somewhat arbitrary. Given this division, in comparison to hydraulic equivalents, pneumatic components tend to be smaller, lighter, and cheaper. Lastly, let's quickly review some safety concerns unique to fluid power systems. As you're no doubt aware, the fluid filling a fluid power system is under pressure. Hoses and containers can catastrophically rupture if pressure exceeds permitted maximums or if the hose or container is damaged. Even if something doesn't explode, compressed air itself can blind or deafen an individual if struck in the eyes or ears. Additionally, compressed air injection into the skin can cause an embolism. Escaping air can blow a veritable shitstorm of sharp, dirty debris in your eyes and lungs. Additionally, properly secured pneumatic hoses can whip around like an angry snake with a special affinity for striking unshielded eyes or genitalia. Always properly secure and test a push-to-fit pneumatic hose and give it a little tug. Never connect or disconnect hoses under pressure. Always wear safety glasses when working with pneumatic systems. At all times, consider the clearance of fluid power actuators and mechanical linkages. At no time should any portion of your anatomy you wish to keep enter the region of travel. Once a cylinder extends, it often does so with tremendous speed or force and can easily punch through metal, not to mention flesh and bone. Be aware of pinch points when working on or around such tremendously powerful tools. A common application for fluid power systems in industrial settings is to lift or suspend heavy objects. The lifted or suspended object itself represents stored energy, as does the fluid under pressure supporting them. These need to be taken into consideration when performing maintenance on these types of systems, and those lifted or suspended objects need to be lowered or blocked out and the pressure relieved from the system before maintenance operation can begin. Additionally, components such as accumulators or reservoirs or springs can store energy in a fluid power system and must be released and locked out prior to performing maintenance. The compressor may be turned off 
but lifted or suspended objects and components like receiver springs and accumulators may still pressurize the system. Finally, fluid under pressure and moving through a system can sometimes present thermal danger. Compressors in pneumatic systems can be unusually hot due to the compression process and equally as cold when discharged. Allow time for these components to return to ambient temperature between shutdown and maintenance. All right, this about wraps up this brief introduction to pneumatic systems. In conclusion, this lecture performed a brief introduction to pneumatic systems. We examined the similarities and important differences between hydraulic and pneumatic systems and compared and contrasted the behavior of systems using incompressible oil and compressible air. Lastly, we reviewed important safety guidance when working with fluid power systems. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank you.